Ted Williams with you. It's the Golden Boys, Golden Boys. That's That's right. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Golden Voice Show. I look like I'm ready for another episode of Casino or something. Robert De Niro, eat your heart out. <laughs> hey, having a great time. I want to thank so many people for uh, taking a look at that first episode. It was uh, it kind of made me nervous. I, I, uh, I got to admit the response has been overwhelming. I'm going to go to my social media in just a minute, but I can't thank you enough. Had a great time doing it, and uh, I look forward to great things to come with this show. So I want to thank the fine people over at Radio Free Network for putting me on their lineup, and we're just going to have a great time. You know, things are going to get bigger, I got to say. I'll tell you about a little bigger thing that's popping out again with me, yours truly, the man with a golden voice. But first, with my over response and my great response, should I say, I want to go to my social media friends and uh, thank them for so much. First, I want to thank the lovely Loana Clark Owens. She made a comment that was very, very uplifting, first of all, and it was also encouraging. Enjoyed the show, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and lots of laughs. Left Columbus, Ted, about uh, in 1965, but Ted, I'm still homesick. Okay, come on back to Columbus, girl. I won't pay for your ticket, but come on back. <laughs> She's like, you better pay for it if you want me to come back. I also have Mary M. Keith, it is. Mary Keith. How you doing, Mary? Thank you for your lovely comments. And she said, Ted, you are so awesome. You're a blessing. You're inspirational, full of wisdom, compassion, and love. And uh, if you ever start touring, Ted, I'd love for you to come on up to where I live, which is in Alberta, Canada. That's right, the Maple Leaf country, right? So uh, it's so beautiful up here, she says. I'll be honored to be your tour guide. Much love and blessings to you, Ted. One of my last ones that I want to give a big, big shout out to, Donna Fortune. How you doing, Donna? Thank you so much for your words of inspiration. She said, I messed up the, with the time change and missed the live show, but I saw it taped, uh, the taped one, and you knocked it out of the ballpark. Now, those are some, just a few of the many comments that were made on my uh, fan page, my uh, Facebook, and I want to thank you all, you know. It's a it's a great it's a great opportunity it's a great consideration and it's all by way of God. And you know what uh, I said I had something to tell you and here's what it is. Dave Chappelle called me again for another spot for his upcoming podcast, which will be on the, uh, oh, I forget, but it's, it's coming real soon, and I'm sure Dave would like me to say, uh, make sure you tune in to him as well. But don't leave mine to go to Dave now. Dave, I love you, but uh. You know, when all of this first happened back in 2011, I got a chance to go out to Hollywood and uh, Snoop wanted uh, first dibs on me. So him and his cousin, I believe, Warren G., they had a uh, television show called The G Connection, pretty much like the dating game, but it was called The G Connection. And I mean, Snoop came in and uh, man, meeting Snoop Dogg was just, mm, <laughs> Really? I, I, let's see. If I had all the rappers and I had just uh, met uh, parents don't understand Mr. Will Smith but uh, and Queen Lativa, they don't compare to my cat Snoop. Yes, that kind of thing. And so uh, Snoop came in and I mean he had some weed for your ass. Snoop came in there with a blunt about that long and, uh, you know, I was I wasn't even two minutes clean well i take that back 24 hours clean i wasn't 24 hours clean but not that the weed uh um was my drug of choice of course but uh he came in and asked me said man now now mind you the weed was all in the air and everything else i only had one suit one suit that i showed up on the today show and a few other uh, uh television programs that i was invited to and that one suit, do you know that that weed stayed in my suit, my one little suit, for about five days? Every time we sent it back out to be cleaned, and it would come back. And when I would go on future shows, even up to the Dr. Phil show, people would be like, you ain't clean. You ain't sober. You know? <laughs> I couldn't tell them. Otherwise, that suit was funked up. I'm going to funk you right on up. No. 
But uh, yeah, it was fun. It, I mean, I just couldn't explain to people where I got. So I didn't want to snitch on Snoop and say everywhere I go, hey, that was Snoop. That wasn't me. But Snoop, brother dog, Snoop Dogg was, I mean, sent it up the joint. Talking about Half Baked, that movie Half Baked. That would have been a good example of what the hell I was dealing with. We did the show. I did the voiceover for it. Had a great time with Warren G and all. Mm, I was scared. I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't smoke none of that. That might have put me in a damn coma. <laughs> What's up, players? Welcome to the G Connection. He has difficulty keeping track of how many females he's totally kissed with his mouth. Please welcome Greg. One of them that they came up with, me, Cat Williams, and bless his heart, rest in peace, DMX on Celebrity Rehab. <laughs> First of all, Cat, uh, you know, I think I would have gotten along with Cat, but... um. I can't see uh, me and DMX, you know, really kicking it because pass me the lighter. Give me that stem. Any more crack? And slap the shit out of me or something. And then I'd have, you know, sued him, of course. So that's just one of the many things that have been offered my way. You know, prior to the Dr. Phil episodes in which me and my family uh, came to uh, California. You have to remember, and I, and, I, and I may mention this a lot of times throughout my shows. One day, homeless, a crackhead standing on a highway corner begging for money. The very following day, I'm on... I'm in New York City. I'm on the Today Show with Matt Lauer and family. And uh, it's just unbelievable. It just makes you really, really know that God is alive and he's still in the area or in the business of blessings and uh, miracles. And that's what my, my story represents, a miracle. Certainly wasn't deserving, but really clueless to the fact that uh, videos go viral. I knew nothing about the internet. I knew nothing about viral, you know, viral to me meant virus. And, 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 and to when everybody said, Ted, you got a viral video in some way. I, I tried to think that it was a virus and that, um, you know, I created problems in the area of the internet with people's phones. And I didn't want to be associated with that. So the hell with that. I don't know nothing about virus. I don't know nothing about viral and I don't want to be on, no, you know, on nothing. So it took me a minute to kind of hear that virus I mean, viral meant great so now i want everything to go viral <laughs> my manager asked me ted when did your spiritual journey begin i've been always a um a spiritual person you know my father was a jehovah witness my mother was a baptist and they sent me to catholic school so i had a wide variety of of knowing god in many ways and in many faiths but um and I also went to Seventh-day Adventist school, you know, and uh, that was quite a journey in itself, but I'll leave that alone. They were disciplinarians at my Seventh-day school. You know, I used to get paddled all the time. Uh, <laughs> but my spiritual journey began when I first became homeless, you know. I actually signed in at one of the homeless shelters here, and uh, I wanted recovery this time for me. I had already, dis uh, you know, discarded the idea of getting back and, and and getting sober for other people, my mom, my family, my woman. But I was ready to do this. So up the street, they had an old recovery club called Club Surrender. Went into Club Surrender and acknowledged myself as an addict and an alcoholic and that I was powerless, okay, over my addiction and my life had become unmanageable. I got all, I, I got to a, a point at, uh, staying at the shelter where my back went out, my lower back. I had an L5 S1 a uh, herniated lower disc. And they gave me Vicodins. They did an epidural on me in the, in the hospital, and which was not pleasant at all. But I prayed to God and I said, Lord, please help me through this. So my back was out and I, I couldn't walk, man, for a minute. I was walking with the aid of a cane. And uh, somebody invited me to church. And the minister then uh, called uh, everybody up to um, for special prayer and for baptismal. They said, is there anyone that wants to become a candidate for baptismal? And I did. I wanted to get, I, I, I can't recall me ever being baptized. So I, I said, maybe that's what I need to do. So I raised my hand. And at the end of the service, the, the, uh, now here's the word, candidate. I thought that I was to be voted in by the congregation to be worthy of being baptized. And Lord, that man said to the uh, ushers and stuff, he said, get him a suit. 
and they came with this wetsuit and they were marching. I said, wait a minute. You know, I, 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 I thought again, it, I, it was, I was going to be voted in for a baptism. And we got to walking up the steps and the pool was there and the church was, oh, Lord. They were going through all kind of, and I'm thinking like, okay, I'm at least I'm in favor of this. And when I stepped in that pool with these little short, de- I'm six foot one. The deacons and everybody that was getting ready to lower me into the water were like five, 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 six. You know, I'm not saying that short, short, but it was a little shorter than what. So I got in there and I got to stand up a little bit and I saw where they were and I figured they was going to bend me back in the water rather crooked. Oh, man, I didn't know what to do. I looked and so something said, kneel down a little bit, at least to their height. So when they splash you, you'll be a plush, plush, like that. Nothing happened, but something did happen. When I stood up and, and my uh, sciatic nerve before I went in was hurting bad. I couldn't sit on a toilet. I used to have to sit like this on a toilet or wherever I sat, I, I was at an angle to make sure I didn't sit on my butt cheek where that sciatic nerve was running parallel to my body. But when I got up out of that water, I could walk. It didn't hurt. I got to doing one of these moves, moving my body and all. And lo and behold, I had no pain, none whatsoever. Went back to the, that was my first time experiencing what God had done for me. I thought that baptismal was on my, I was on my way to something big, something big. And uh, I didn't, uh, after close to six months, you know, I thanked the Lord. I tremendous every day. I just knew the next thing I asked for because I had asked for him to help me with my back and to help me with my recovery. Well, the back came first. I knew the recovery was second. Unfortunately, the devil got me three days before I was supposed to celebrate my sixth month clean. And if I'd have made it to that day, and I told the truth about it, let me tell you, when I got into that room and they said, anybody with six months today, and the girl that was celebrating her same clean time as I was, jumped up and said, hi, my name is such and such, and I got six months to clean. Everybody went wild, and they looked over at me as if to say, well, aren't you getting up? And I started like, a, you know, getting a little emotional. I cried a little bit, and I jumped up, and was getting ready to walk out because I couldn't admit to everybody right then and there. I relapsed yesterday. Um, here's a funny Ted <laughs> Kathy story. You know, I I drop food from time to time. I don't do it now, but back then I would drop potato chip or something I, I was eating, and I would always, as a child, I would kiss it up to God. A lot of people refer to it as the five second or the three second rule. You know, I drop the potato chip on the ground. I don't waste nothing. Nothing. I don't waste nothing. Even today, I don't waste. You know, if, if somebody gives me an overabundance, my mother always made me, you eat what she put on your plate. Don't ask for no more if you don't. So I drop something, I pick it up, and I eat it. I kiss it up to God first. And then I felt like it was worthy. I, you know, if it didn't, if it dropped in spit or something, I wouldn't do it. But if it dropped, I pick it up, kiss it up to God, and eat it. And Kathy would always say, you know, like, that just fell on the ground. What are you eating it for? And I will always would say, Vietnam. And Vietnam, that word meant to me about those third world country children who sit up and would beg for that potato chip that I dropped or that piece of gum or whatever it was. They would love to have had that. So who am I to sit up and just waste it, you know? So I, and whenever it was, and she would always look, look at it like, my God, how nasty. I'm not going to kiss you tonight or your breath stinks or <laughs> many things like that. So one day we were at a hotel and we spent about a thousand dollars on crack. Yeah. We had made about, spent it all, uh, a great deal of money there. And when it came down to it, we didn't have anything to eat. She said, honey, she saw I was hungry. And I, I get a little crazy or cross or whatever you want to say. And so she said, I'll be right back, sweetheart. I'm going to get us something to eat. And in less than a minute and a half, she came in with this box of pizza. And, you know, people are kind. I thought maybe somebody gave her a pizza. They came, oh, you're hungry? You want another pizza or whatever? She came in with this box of pizza. And I said, wow, great. She opened it up. It had three slices in it. And I was like, well, where would you get this from? She said, you know, the room down the hall, they sat it outside in the hallway. And I looked at her and I said, damn, I ain't eating that. That's nasty. 
She picked it up a piece of pizza, bit it, and said, Vietnam, Vietnam. <laughs> I couldn't do nothing but eat that damn pizza. And it was good. But yeah, she gave me a taste of my own medicine. <laughs> and for the life of me, I will never forget. That story is etched in my heart because she, bless her heart, got the, a chance to see what I was talking about. But let's just say, you never know what you will do when you're hungry, right? That's the... Dun, 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 dun. I'm what you call a Vietnam era vet. Okay, I was in the era of Vietnam, never served any combat, but uh, I managed to make it over to Korea, South Korea. I hung out with the Koreans because I loved them, you know, and uh, I learned a song. It was a love song. And um, when I go, and, and I mean, I nailed it. I nailed this song where people just couldn't imagine how I knew it so well. And from time to time, some of the Korean outlet stores here that I go to or whatever, when I hit them with that song, you should see the look in their face of awe. Like, where did you learn that? How did you learn it so well? Why do you speak Korean so well? I don't do as well as I used to, but um, I'm just going to give you a little piece of it. And what it is, Pusan, Korea is a fishing port. And the song's gist is that, um, you know, uh, Koreans get called to duty, and one of the duties that they call, they, they go out for, is fishing, you know? So they were called to serve in a fishing unit to go out to the seas and all. And this guy had just fallen in love. A, a guy and woman had just fallen in love and acquired a relationship, and here he's being called to sea. And, you know, those seas can get rather rough, and so she didn't know whether he'd be coming back or not, you know? And all, and this guy is singing, and it's, uh, that's the gist of the song. And for uh, an American to sing it as well as I did, you know, they, it would bring some people. So one restaurant I went to, it was a Korean restaurant, and I love bulgogi, uh, and I don't eat kimchi. Uh -uh. But that's grown with human feces. <laughs> um, it goes like this. Pusan hange kalmegi man sul piune oriokto toro kanun yelrak san mata and then here's the here's the chorus tul hawayo pusan hange oriokto toro ka Oh, I kind of messed it. It's been a while since I sang it. But if I have any Korean people out there listening or watching, I want you to know that I, I hold that song dear. And like I said, I nailed it. To, to hear somebody say, Kalmegi man. Wait, 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 how's it go? Ah, I, I'll, I'll do it on my next podcast. If, if you know a friend who's Korean or who could, I, I guarantee you they'll say, oh, he did a good job. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're like, oh, he did a bad job in imitating us. But um, yeah, Korea was truly an experience. I spent 18 months over there. And um, anybody served in the 8th Army knows what I'm talking about. It's a beautiful country, uh, great things. Now, I don't know nothing about North Korea. I'm not Dennis Rodman, who made a trip up there. And, and Donald Trump, ex-president, former president Donald Trump, um, uh, who made a trip to North Korea. I'm telling you, when I was in South Korea, there was a, what they call the demilitarized zone, second division. It was a bridge. And if you crossed that bridge, North Korea would shoot you off of it. That, that, I'm serious. I don't care who you are. You make it anywhere on that bridge, pow, sniper, pop you right off. It was called the bridge of no return, obviously. But I, I had friends of mine that used to say, Ted, Ted, go on the bridge, man. Take a shot. Everybody will know where you... Yeah, take a shot, all right. I'd have got one right in the back of the head. But I want to let you know that I had a great time doing this show along with the other shows yet to come because, like I said, they're going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, hopefully I can get bigger with it. You know, I'm just having the time of my life entertaining you the way you've always wanted to. Hey, listen, I have a post note to this broadcast. I want to I wanna make a, a, a strong opinion here. I hear that there are a lot of people out there that are saying F America, F what America stands for, F our troops over there, you know, uh, this, that, and the other. 
There, this, this country for over 200 years has been fought for, uh, fought for the freedoms of people, fought for your freedom that you're sitting up here telling people F America and all of that. God bless America because if you were somewhere else, you'd be wanting to get back here. You can believe that. People have died for your freedoms. You know what I'm saying? Hey, let me tell you something. Every time I've been overseas and come back, I'm always kissing the ground. I kissed the airport terminal. After all, Vietnam, right? <laughs> I have definitely been thankful to be alive in what we call the United States of America. I'm proud to be an American, and I hope you are too. Stop saying all that crazy shit. Otherwise, like I said, buy you a one-way ticket to one of them places you want to go. I love you. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of my service mission till I return to burn on the next episode. Brother man, sister too if you can, be nice to someone short. You never know when someone short has to be nice to you. In the meantime, in between time, if you're driving on the highways and the byways, or if you're in the street on your feet, do remember to take it with care to get there. Until the next episode, may your God be with you. Talk to you then. That's right.